Next, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. John LaPuma. Dr. LaPuma is the New York Times bestselling author of seven books translated into 10 languages and selling over a million copies. He is the co-founder of ChefMD, a consumer health media company, and is considered the founder of culinary medicine, now taught in 50% of U.S. medical schools worldwide. He is also founder of ecomedicine.org, a new field of practice and research in medicine and a nature-based approach to optimal personal and planetary well-being. Dr. LaPuma has lectured on nature therapy, ecomedicine, and culinary medicine. He co-hosted the National Cable Weekly series Health Corner for Lifetime TV for five years and 120 episodes. He's published over 60 peer-reviewed scientific papers, three medical books, and hundreds of other works. Dr. LaPuma currently focuses on helping patients connect with nature, especially gardening as a way of enjoying themselves while also improving mental focus, generalized anxiety, and obesity. He has identified nature deficit disorder as a clinical problem. He considers nature to be an outpatient clinic with the ability to help people live, feel, and look years younger. Dr. LaPuma currently stewards a certified organic and regenerative demonstration and sensory urban avocado and rare citrus farm in Santa Barbara, California, and consults on therapeutic gardens, food forests, and hospital gardens. Welcome, Dr. LaPuma. Well, thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be with you all. And Mark, thank you especially for the invitation, for the mentorship, the kindness over the years, and, and this great conference. I'm so grateful to be here. Um, I'm going to speak today with you about ecomedicine, which I think is a new evidence-based field in medicine and its ethical issues. Um, this talk has five parts, ecomedicine's definition, our patient cases, its evidence base, and its contributing disciplines, and then three major categories of ethical issues I think it raises that are relevant for all clinicians. Ecomedicine can be described as the prescriptive evidence-based use of natural settings to prevent and treat symptoms and diseases and to enhance well-being. Its vision is to be available to every family, regardless of their proximity to blue or green space, blue space, of course, being space associated with water and green space being associated with plants. The scholar who is credited with coining the term bioethics, Van Rensselaer Potter, whose book Bioethics in start, helped to jumpstart the field, actually thought of bioethics as being concerned with environmental issues, not with biomedical ones, but because of the biomedical issues of the 70s, philosophers and then clinicians turned their attention towards the idea that bioethics was about biomedicine and not about the environment, maybe Van Rensselaer Potter had it right. Oliver Sacks wrote about the healing power of gardens. He thought that music and gardens were the two modalities that would reach patients with neurologic injury or conditions that no other therapies would. He suggested and wrote about an elderly lady with Parkinson's disease whom he met in Guam, this from the New York Times piece a few years ago, often finding herself frozen, unable to initiate movement, which as you know, is a common problem for those with Parkinsonism. But once, he writes, we led her into the garden where plants and a rock garden provided a varied landscape, she was galvanized by this and would rapidly, unaided, climb up the rocks and down again. And for those of who have taken care of patients with Parkinsonism, that's quite an image. Uh, Joshua Shore wrote in the New England Journal a piece on how birding, the identification of birds by their sounds and sights, cured his burnout. And I've spoken with Dr. Shore after he wrote his essay and he's heard from many clinicians who find nature to be exactly what they need to deal with the pressures of clinical medicine. Uh, Howard Frumpkin, this is now the research agenda for ecomedicine, wrote this piece in 2017 with his colleagues at the University of Washington when he was dean at, and the School of Public Health there. And this uh, review of several hundred articles has now formed the basis of the NIH's agenda to give out grants in this area. Frumpkin and his colleagues looked at both the medical benefits of nature and the mental health benefits, and most people don't appreciate that there are data describing exposure to nature, specific nature experiences and interventions 
that have improved post-operative recovery, that have reduced obesity and diabetes, that have improved and even reversed myopia. We're more familiar with the mental health benefits of nature, the reduction in anxiety and depression, uh, which of course are epidemic with the pandemic. Uh, this review coming out next month in population health scans even more pieces. It's a meta-analysis that looks at different outdoor activities and focuses on them and their benefits for mental and physical health. The literature in this area is growing quite rapidly as is its quality. I think that the movement towards eco-medicine, the idea that nature can be a specific therapeutic modality by itself, both preventing and treating diseases and improving well-being, the purpose of medicine, according to Dr. Gotwandi and others, is the result of two great migrations. One is a migration inside that we've taken. We spend 87% of our time in buildings and 6% in vehicles. And that was pre-COVID. A recent analysis I saw suggested that we spend 90% of our time in buildings, inside. The second big migration has been to cities. In North America, we spend 82% of our time in, uh, excuse me, of us live in urban areas, but just 5% of US land is urban, which means that we sort of push nature out as we infill inner cities, and that has direct health and other consequences, one of which is that we are more and more disconnected from nature and don't understand it well as part of our lives and think of it ourselves as separate from it when we're actually a part of it. Um, this slide from an epidemiologic journal last year shows a trend in reduction of hypertension and cardiovascular disease and diabetes prevalence as incidents rather as tree canopy increases and total green space increases. Uh, these are done with fascinating satellite photos and drone photos showing that diabetes and hypertension and cardiovascular disease, both with total green space and with tree canopy decline. Of course, there are many factors in this, but I'm gonna show you some data that suggests that uh, green space is directly associated with health in not just these ways. Um, this slide uh, captions a study uh, done identifying outdoor play and outdoor space as uh, reversing and uh, halting the uh, progression of myopia. As you know, myopia is epidemic in Asia, especially between up to 90% of kids in Asia are myopic, 40% of Californians are myopic, about 30% overall more in Asian folks. And um, that's thought to be in part because of near work, the idea that everybody has a phone or screen often, um, and perhaps uh, being outside can reverse that. In fact, it seems to have. Here's a study uh, putting together four studies showing that you need about two hours a day to um, improve uh, to improve myopia and slow its uh, progression. Um, this is thought in part to be because of uh, the light stimulation of retinal dopamine, which uh, modifies axial growth. Um, in Singapore, uh, there are public health campaigns to go outside to keep myopia away. Uh, this is a study that summarizes a, a pilot that we did in Santa Barbara with the Sansom Clinic showing that kids who looked at virtual reality of swimming under the sea with fish, um, looking down at the beach and looking above at the sky while getting a flu shot had 50% less pain, 50% less fear of injection, and much happier experience. The nurses who got the same um, uh, questionnaire thought so too, as, and the nurses uh, actually thought the, the clinic went more smoothly. Their parents got the same questionnaire and had the same kinds of results. Um, this is a study showing, um, published in 2003, interestingly, in CHEST, showing that pain control during bronchoscopy for people who got before the bronchoscopy, the a visual scene of a babbling brook, as well as the accompanying sounds of a babbling brook, had about 50% better pain control than ordinary pain control for pain, uh, bronchoscopy. This is a randomized control trial as well. This study, which came out in June of this year, showed that enriched gardens, which are gardens with stimulatory modules that uh, like um, musical instruments, actually improve cognition, improve memory short term, 
and improve behavior among nursing home residents that had dementia. This is a small pilot control study, just about 40 people, but it was in multiple sites and bears, of course, more interest. There are a number of disciplines that contribute to this new idea of eco-medicine, architecture, aromatherapy, clinical medicine, of course, horticulture, forestry. It's a multidisciplinary contributed field. Um, now, not everybody's used to prescribing nature, so I'm gonna show you what that can look like. I think you need to sit down, Marvin. Please. Okay. Look, there's no easy way to say this, but your nature levels are low. My nature levels? Yes, you tested negative for hiking, negative for landmark exposure, and sunset vistas. I tested negative for sunset vistas? Also, your pine needle numbers are almost anemic. And in my 35 years of practice, I've never seen someone with camping scores lower than you. Oh my gosh, I hate camping. I know you do, but we gotta change that, okay? Okay, okay. I think you need to sit down, Marvin. Please. Okay. Let's play the whole thing. Eric, go ahead and play the whole thing. Let's see. I think you need to sit down, Marvin. Please. Okay. Look, there's no easy way to say this, but your nature levels are low. My nature levels? Yes, you tested negative for hiking, negative for landmark exposure, and sunset vistas. I tested negative for sunset vistas? Also, your pine needle numbers are almost anemic. And in my 35 years of practice, I've never seen someone with camping scores lower than you. Oh my gosh, I hate camping. I know you do, but we gotta change that, okay? Okay, okay. Am I gonna live indoors the rest of your life? No. In fact, I'll tell you what. I'm gonna write you a prescription for the national parks. Right. There's a lot of stuff you can do there. They got, you know, animals, bears, You'll love it. Anyway, they got coastlines, grasslands, history, culture. Right away, you're going to notice that your NELs are going to bounce right back, dude. Uh, my NELs? Nature engagement levels. Right. So... That's one way to prescribe nature. There are others. Um, here are some specialty fields in eco-medicine. Ecotherapy, which takes a psychological approach. Care farms, which are residential. Thousands of them actually in the Netherlands and hundreds in the uh, UK. Um, forest bathing, which has become popular and uh, with, uh, idea, with classes offered everywhere from uh, Harvard to Santa Barbara Botanic Garden. And therapeutic horticulture, which guides uh, individuals to, who are uh, PTSD or uh, ADHD or other problems focusing. It's really a burgeoning field. Um, uh, we created naturedeficitquiz.com and comfortnaturequiz.com to help patients identify what were their favorite places in nature and uh, to learn more about them and enjoy them more. Um, comfort nature quiz is the idea that you have a comfort nature place, like there you have a comfort nature, you have a comfort food about which I've spoken in this forum before. Uh, comfort nature places also seem to alleviate stress when you're in them and enjoy them. If you don't know what yours is, uh, you can take the quiz, as can your patients. We'll send three options to you with little audio clips of each. Um, here are three big categories of ethical issues that eco medicine raises that I think are relevant for clinicians and that I'd like to discuss with you now. Uh, the first has to do with equity, and we've heard quite a lot about that here already in the last couple of days, and uh, it's also true for nature. The idea that uh, ec nature is not distributed evenly or equitably, that it is um, uh, of therapeutic value and yet not everybody has access to it, in large part because of structural racism, but also in, in part because of of uh, income and, and simply neighborhood. Um, these issues are essential to health, and I'll show you in a moment why. Um, 
Clinicians, I think, ought to prescribe parks if patients want them and can determine the park. And actually, that's been tested, whether you should go to a park that your clinician suggests, which is not as good as the one that you might like. But what about parks in unsafe neighborhoods? Should we recommend nature in unsafe neighborhoods? Seems like a hard no. And yet, there may be benefits. And of course, what about people who do not have access, uh, people of color, ind indigenous peoples, um, does it serve not to recommend nature to them because uh, of their many access difficulties, the many buses, and then the many buses back if they're lucky? Next. So here's a piece from PLS1 that shows tree cover and temperature disparity in urbanized areas across 5,700 communities was published in the spring of this year, showing that among others, Chicago actually is way up there in the need for better tree cover which is fascinating because Chicago itself is so rich in trees, we think. We think of the many parks and beautiful neighborhoods, but of course, in tougher neighborhoods on here in the South Side, there, those trees don't exist. And what effect does that have? Well, actually, urban trees are active. They're active like medications are active. They have these different benefits. They reduce air pollution. They cool, they provide shade, but they also uh, increase physical activity and support social cohesion. They're one of the benefits of nature that many people don't get is that you actually are able to run into other people and socialize, and it gives you a better sense of community in better neighborhoods. Um, there's a great piece about air pollution in the New England Journal this week that identifies uh, tree canopy and its absence as a social determinant of health, which it really should be. I'm gonna say a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, here, the second major category of issues are conflicts with policy. And during COVID, we heard that we ought not to go outside, that we ought to stay inside. And of course, many of us have taken this to heart and in fact, continue to take it to heart even as we open up. And yet, it isn't clear that that's the best choice, um, that maybe clinicians ought to override this public health advice because it's so difficult to get COVID outside, and also because uh, nature has benefits that you don't get inside. Although the benefits of inside nature need also to be examined in more detail. Whether hospitals and, and clinics ought to allocate space to natural settings like gardens, and many of us know that, that gardens, of course, go way back, in fact, centuries back, as part of hospitals and medical schools, and, and actually used to provide a medication for the formularies, uh, as well as solace for um, for patients and families and for hospital workers. In fact, the garden that I helped design uh, with the great architects at MBBJ for Loma Linda University uh, included a cardiovascular garden, an immune garden, and a pediatric garden, but one of their primary purposes was in fact for respite for hospital workers who could find a cove uh, and a quiet place to be with their thoughts outside in a green or blue setting. Um, and then finally, technological and technical issues in eco-medicine. I think these are also fascinating. You should augmented reality and virtual reality and Mark Zuckerberg's new metaverse and a prescription for the kind of goggles that we showed kids to help them with their flu vaccines substitute for actual lived nature experience, what is the difference between that kind of experience that's one, one sense or two senses versus one that's five senses? When you go outside, um, should you turn your phone to no notifications, to uh, airplane mode, to not at all, so that you can better experience nature, including in fact all of your senses, and that's actually how nature is best experienced through your senses? Uh, and speaking of that, what about the earbuds that we wear everywhere? We're, sure, we're learning things, we're hearing music, we're doing something else, but it does it deprive us of a beneficial soundscape? And then finally, what about raising hydroponic vegetables? Uh, it, there are real benefits to having your hands in the soil. There are bacteria that raise your serotonin levels. There are, uh, the, there's the connection with the earth that's quite physical. There's the nurturing of something that bears fruit that you've taken care of. Is that the same for hydroponic gardens? or do we all need to have our hands in the dirt? So here are some quick summaries of, uh, that's a quick summary of eco-medicine. 
as a new evidence-based field in medicine and three ethical issues. Thank you so much for your attention. I look forward to your questions.